it can be overweening and tyrannical, so it can go too far and be negative, but it's also a positive force because it counterbalances the blind, selfish, impulsive, narrow drives of the id and makes social organization possible. Hey there, it's hard to find good help for many people today. With so much information, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and that you don't have any way to surf through the noise. Luckily, motivational speakers can help. Subscribe to us for endless motivation. Whenever a developing mind encounters a comprehensive set of novel ideas, there is the initial danger of sliding into uncritical acceptance of those ideas. And that can happen whenever you read anyone who's thought through things with some degree of thoroughness. So I fell into Nietzsche, I fell into Dostoevsky, I fell into Jung, I fell into Freud, I fell into Rogers. Uh, the, the latter are all clinicians. When I teach my personality course, when I taught my personality course at Harvard and at U of T, I would present each thinker in the strongest possible terms. And but even though they didn't always agree, that there was a central element of agreement, but certainly plenty of disagreement. And that was somewhat disconcerting to the students because they would identify with one thinker and then we'd go on to another and they'd identify with them and then we'd go on to another and, and so on. But I, I think that's okay as long as you come out the other end and you tend to. And so when you encounter a new set of ideas, you do tend to a adopt them somewhat dogmatically to begin with as you're puzzling through them. And then later, with more development and more reading, you kind of come back to yourself. And so I think that's part of the developmental course of expanding your philosophical or psychological knowledge. Um, I do warn against oversimplified thinking. That's a method. Uh, it's actually a, a discourse on methodology of thought. You know, wh what I warn against primarily there are low resolution answers to low resolution questions. What should we do about the planet's ecology? Well, that's just not a very good question. It's way too vague. How should we restructure our economic system? Well, it's too global and vague. Th those, those questions don't lead to productive answers because they're ill-formed. Um, how do we make people less aggressive? That's another category, another question of that type. You have to differentiate the questions so to a, to a very high degree before you can before you can be reasonably sure that your conceptualization is productive and not dangerous, and so that you have some shot at perhaps answering the question in part. So with regards to aggression, for example, maybe you're concerned about interpersonal aggression, aggression between people, you might be able to say, how could we reduce the incidence of physical aggression, kicking, biting and hitting, for example, among six-year-old boys in a given geographical locale? A much more specific sort of question. So uh, I would encourage people to think in detail and not to accept blanket ideological answers. You do that in proportion to your ignorance of the field. Like we, all of us want to have a complete map of the world, but we lack differentiated knowledge of many, many things. And so when an ideology comes along that purports to provide all the answers to even questions that we haven't yet asked, we're likely to be to welcome it because it fills in the gaps in our map. But you have to be careful of confusing that with genuine knowledge. Um, and then and and you have to strive towards genuine knowledge. So I would say for people who believe perhaps that they've fallen too deeply under the sway of my ideas, the best antidote to that would be to read other people. I have a reading list online at jordanbpeterson.com under books. There's a list of recommended books there, which were books that I found particularly influential. You know, so maybe that would just cement the dogma, but I don't think it would. And so broader reading is is advised and and writing as well, for that matter, if you really want to learn to think in, the, in a revelatory manner, creative manner, and also in a critical manner, writing and editing is an extremely useful thing to do. So, but I'll reiterate, you know, when you first encounter a set of philosophical ideas, especially if you're not in, haven't been inclined to think philosophically that much in the past, you're very much likely to come under the powerful sway of the first trained mind that you encounter. But 
well, don't stop there. You know, there's lots of other people to read. I guess the other thing I would recommend, I viewed the teaching that I did and the writing, especially with Maps of Meaning, as an antidote to ideology. And because I came, you know, it's not easy to differentiate ideology from belief or ideology from religion for that matter. So what's the difference between ideology and religious belief or belief per se? Um, my sense was that an ideology not only provides a very low resolution representation of the world, but it also tends to only tell part of the story. Now, so then you might ask, well, what's the whole story? And that's a very complicated question. But my answer to that, and this is a consequence of reading deeply into the clinical. literature. My hypothesis about that was something that was essentially, it turned out being essentially akin to Freud. Now, Freud produced a very balanced picture of the psyche, which is part of the reason Freud's thinking was so influential and part of the reason why his thinking still saturates our thinking, even though we think we've dispensed with Freud. Actually, what we've done is incorporated the most brilliant insights of Freud so deeply that we think of them as presuppositions now, obvious, like that we have an ego. Everyone knows what the id is, or virtually everyone or certainly believes that we're driven by fundamentally you know, unconscious and biological drives. That's a very Freudian idea. And that that there is some superego, you know, the effect of society upon us, or at least some concept that's akin to that. We've, we've taken a lot of Freud's ideas, but Freud was very balanced because he talked about the id so you could think about that as na nature within, it's the natural world within. It was a positive element and a negative element. It was the source of all energy, but also it was blind in its motivational demands, let's say, blind and wild in its motivational demands, unruly and dangerous as a force, although completely necessary. And then the ego, well, the ego was had a positive element and a negative element as well. So, and then the super egos, that's society, all things considered, that's the patriarchy in, in, from the Freudian perspective. It can be overweening and tyrannical, so it can go too far and be negative, but it's also a positive force because it counterbalances the blind, selfish, impulsive, narrow drives of the id and makes social organization possible. So Freud has a three-tier view of psychological reality and each element has a positive and negative uh, uh, pole. And to me, that indicates a balanced theory. Um, I believe that an intact religion tends to produce a balanced representation of that sort, and that what ideology, 
ideologies do is parasitize that fundamental narrative. And so I can outline two ideologies. So I would say that the, the narrative... the settling of the United States in particular, the frontier myth, that's a ideology. So it's positive individual. That's the, you know, forthright pioneer, boldly going where no one has gone before. Because a positive view of civilization and society, because along with the pioneering spirit comes the civilization that's imposed on, well, then there's nature, negative. It needs civilizing. It's a wild force and the positive individual bringing benevolent culture to this savage world. That's the frontier myth. And it's very motivating and it's true because that's a story that can be acted out, but it's incomplete. And I believe that that was compensated for, that incompleteness was compensated for, that this started to happen in the, early, in the late 1800s with the rise of the conservation ethic, but also really manifested itself in the 1960s with the environmentalist ideology. And I'm not saying that there is no valid environmentalist claims that that's a different issue, but there's a narrative. The individual is a power hungry despoiler. Society is fundamentally uh, rapacious, greedy and devouring. And mother nature is being in her, all her innocence raped continually. So, and you see, that's exactly the opposite of the frontier myth, wherever it lacked. So the frontier myth had a negative view of nature, although it could be fertile, but only, you know, if social, if, so, if brought under the sway of the proper social processes, civilization, agriculture, all of that, it had to be tamed. Nature it was wild. Well, the environmental nature is everything beautiful in and of itself, the benevolence of, of mother nature. And society on the frontier myth side is a civilizing force and on the environmentalist side is a despoiling force and the individual is a hero in the um, frontier myth, but a villain, essentially a villain, a selfish, greedy, grasping, devouring villain on the environmentalist front. Now, if you put both of those together, you get a whole, you get the whole story. Now, of course, it's rife with paradoxes and that's problematic. People don't like that. but. It's much more comprehensive. And so I've suggested to people that, you know, if you only have a negative view of the patriarchy, for example, well, where's the positive element? And if you only have a positive view of nature, well, you know, what about cancer and guinea worms? I think they're called guinea worms. Um, they're a kind of parasitic worm that I, whose nature I don't want to go into, but aren't pleasant and have thankfully been eradicated. Uh, and then with regard to the individual too, is like, well, there should be polarity there. Um, 
And I think in a well-functioning religious system provides you with a polarized view of all these different levels of reality, individual, social, and natural, and ideologies fragment that. And so they gain their power by riding like parasites on an underlying religious reality, essentially, a uh, religious narrative that's necessary to orient you properly in the world, functionally in the world, and, and functionally both with regard to yourself, functionally with regard to yourself, nature and society.